if you remember from many other times that I've been visited, I, I talked about a roadmap uh, going from a point A to a point B in a direction in which to go and that there were always multiple directions to go in, in terms of being um, well and being healthy and, and, and staying well and healthy. Um, but <clears throat> so there's a, there's a different way of thinking about health. And most of the time when I was talking about health, I was talking about staying away from disease and preventing disease. And that was my way of thinking. And in the last couple of years, I've been learning more about that there are different ways of thinking about this. And that having or not having diseases is one way of thinking about health. But that there's a different view, a different approach, if you will, to health. And it's not so much about staying away from diseases. Um, now, obviously being healthy, most of us will uh, agree that the definition of being healthy is to stay away from diseases. So, so I'm not trying to challenge that definition, but just a different way of thinking about how do we approach our, li our lifestyle and our living in such a way that <clears throat> we pursue health, stay away from diseases, but not necessarily treat these two things as the same thing, if you will. So that's going to be the premise of what I'm going to try to describe. So this is a model, a model that I am in my mind playing with. And, 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 and it's not my model has been, this is described actually, I think in the 1970s, 1980s is where the initial um, uh, conception of this model came about. And lately it's capturing some additional interest from very interesting perspective. So in this model, there is, there's an arrow on the, on the screen where it says there's a, a point A, which is says here sense of coherence, which I'll, I'll, I'll expand in a second. And then it shows a direction. So this is point A going to point B on the circle on the red, which is this is death. And, you know, like <clears throat> the colloquial statement says there are two things that are inevitable in life, death and taxes, right? So we're not gonna contest the fact that death at some point in the journey of all of us is that inevitable. But that's not the point. The point is the journey, not really the destination. And so in this diagram, if you treat this as the place where we are in present, when we're thinking about this, present doesn't have to even be really today, this Thursday, but in the moment that we think about this concept, which is, has to be before we actually have, get to death, because death is in the future when we no longer think about this concept. In that journey, there's this concept of pathogenesis. Pathogenesis basically means diseases. And this is what we doctors get trained into, you know, second year medical school class is the pathology class. And that's where they teach us the diseases. And so it is the model of physician and medicine in general is that we're, we're okay until we have a disease and then we're not okay anymore. And now we all focus about the disease. And so when you go to the doctor and you have this problem or that problem, you have this diagnosis, we do this test and we give you a medicine and we treat surgery a lot of us feel like we're treating diseases, right? Not necessarily always like we're treating us as a person. So there's this a conversation that's been going on for a long time about the whole person and how to take care of that, not just take care of the disease. This is just trying to represent that mentality where, where, where you're, you don't come to the doctor, but we assume you're fine until the day something bothers you and there's a, there's a disease. Now we deal with that disease. And that's the concept of health that most of us have. It's the concept of health I train in the concept of health that I've been practicing for many, many years. Um, but that, you know, lately I've been thinking more about, is there other ways of thinking about this? Before I move forward with this concept, we need to kind of address the sense of coherence. So what is the sense of coherence? And to this, this, um, to this theory, sense of coherence is an integral point. It's kind of a sense of where you are. It's the location of where you are in the present, but it is not a physical location or a time location. It's kind of a conceptual location. And so I'm going to read the definition. Sen sen sense of coherence is defined as the extent to which one has a pervasive, enduring thought, endur enduring though dynamic feeling of confidence that one's environment is predictable and that things will work out as well as can reasonably be expected, it is in essence a combination of optimism and control. 
So it's kind of this state on which you think, okay, I got things under control, things are going okay, everything is going to be fine, you know, things are going as good as I want them to be, I'm in control of it. And that's a kind of a definition of, of health, if you will, or state of being that could be lead you to health. <clears throat> Now, this is a debatable concept, but just if we accept it as it's given to us by the author back in 1987, Antonovic, um, <clears throat> I propose to you that, you know, when you accept that you are in a sense of coherence, you have some control, pathogenesis doesn't give you control. When you have pneumonia, you have no control. You've got pneumonia. So there, in pathogenesis, there's very little control, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, on the new concept, which is the concept of salutogenesis, which is the new word here, <clears throat> you are you start from a sense of control and optimism where you can actually then direct where you want to go, which could be in a different dis direction, not from the death with like this cartoon proposed, but from the pathogenesis concept. So salutogenesis, in a way, is kind of a, a sense that you can actually do things optimistically being some control of your environment and the environment is very important if you are have if you're homeless and there is no way of getting food you don't control the environment you no longer are in control to be in salutogenesis if you will and pursue health so 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 contr so control is important for this um but now it gives the possibility that there are two ways to live a life. You can live in a path of pathogenesis where you're just dealing with diseases and find diseases, or one where you can exert some control and have some optimism to what you would do. And that is a pathway to health. So health is not just the negation of disease, but it's rather a quest, an active quest of something to which we kind of set up the state of mind and the approach to it. Anybody have any, any reaction to that? Are you, is this is the ways you always thought of it or is this a different way of thinking about things? About have you heard this word before? Oh, that's wonderful, because I'm trying to learn more about this. So, <laughs> no, I didn't hear this about Sharon. I heard this from an NIH program that I went to. The NIH has some interest on, on, on evolving the concept of salutinogenesis. Yeah, that's right. This was apparently very popular in the 80s and 90s. And there was a lot of interest of exploring this. Uh, the Europeans have taken on this quite a bit. Uh, I, I think so. They just don't know it. Right. <laughs> I'll show you that in a cartoon, in a coming upcoming cartoon. Um, I, I think people are just, you know, either the concept is really understanding what people are to going towards, or we're just going towards where the concept is already. I don't know where the chicken and the egg on this is, but. I struggle with the notion that. The yeah, this cartoon is this diagram is not really um, is not really about the death point. The death point is kind of a given that doesn't change regardless. So so it's really the, the concept that you can be on a path where you're just dealing and, and arguing and cha challenging disease or you're in a path where you are promoting and or trying to promote salutogenesis. And that they are not necessarily the same. The, the reason they're an opposite is, is to create the image that they're not the same. They may be, they may be similar at moments, but they're not necessarily the same concept. And so I'm going to propose that kind of how that looks a little bit. Why they're not, why can't we think, how, how is it that we can think of them as not being the same? That's what I'm going to go. So when you're in this place of sense of coherence where you got that sense of optimism and that control of your environment and you're in a dynamic event process, things are changing, you can change things around and whatnot. Um, 
<clears throat> you have to defend yourself or you have to resist. And this is called the general resistance concept circle down here. You have to resist disease, right? And resist death. So we put a seatbelt on because we want to resist the chance of dying if we get in a car accident, right? Uh, we don't walk on the ledges of a building because we want to resist the chance that we're going to stumble and fall off the building and die, right? So we're resisting that possibility uh, that what we're going to do, it's going to in some way hurt us or cause us harm. And so a deficit of that ability to resist is what leads to disease. That's what this concept proposed. So it's a so we normally naturally have the ability and the control of an environment. If we have again, I, I, I have to be very thoughtful about the idea that not everyone controls their environment. And so I'm not referring to that lack of control of your environment. But if you are in a situation where you have the ability to control things around you, that then we can then if you actually have acquired diseases, uh, you somehow there's some sort of deficit of the ability to resist. So if your immune system is low and now you catch a bad cold in comparison to others, but have a better immune system, then you had a deficit of your ability to resist that cold because your immune system wasn't. So it is the concept that diseases come about. So if you have autoimmune disorders like um, arthritis or whatnot, uh, your body has, again, an inability to resist the antibodies that your body makes against your own body, and that's how disease comes about. And so it is, it is you know, you can get applied this concept of general resistant deficits. If you have a genetic predisposition for breast cancer, your body doesn't have the ability to fight the natural living span, and then you have a deficit in your ability to clear the cancer cells if they were to pop up. And now you have a genetic predisposition. So this is the concept of, you can see how diseases or frame diseases in a concept of a general resistance deficit towards go down the pathogenic direction. Okay, but yeah. Uh-huh, yep. Away from it towards health. Yeah, so the question is about how during life, there's a lot of things that happen to us. If I understood your comments and question, that lots of things happens to us that uh, we, we, we feel and we go through or we get exposed to, and we don't always get to, you know, have something to say about it, you know, in other words, and that <clears throat> we may not be able to control everything is what, if, if I understand correctly, um, things. Um, and I, so, so this is this is this is not a perfect, this is not a, a zero sum game thing. If you do this, you're never going to get that. Um, but it's the idea that living, living and aging, are not necessarily disease bound, unless something happens. So, so, so the natural progression of humans, unless something else happened, and that something else could be many things. Uh, but unless something else happened, it's not bound to be a disease a suffering disease pathogenic life. Uh, it's hard to believe that sometimes. And I trust me, I, I, I talk to people all the time about their conditions. Sometimes it's hard to believe that it's not that way. And that's part of what I'm trying to kind of stimulate the idea that just because we see or feel that as a personal thing, or we see it in our families and friends and others, that does not mean that all humanity is bound to be that way, <laughs> that there are actually ways that it doesn't have to be that way.
Um, but it takes a lot of understanding of how we get to that way and how to then promote or, or, or address these deficits. So genetic mutations, for example, pollution, um, all these things we don't necessarily control, but these are identifiable deficits of the ability of the human body and the human person to stay away from, from diseases. Um, just because we learn and acknowledge them and recognize what the causes are, doesn't mean that we can always do something about them. And prevention is when you can do something about something and then keep it from happening or delaying it happening. So wearing a mask during a pandemic is a way of preventing infection and kept a lot of people from having more infections. So we, we understood and we had something to do that could actually change the course of things. That was prevention. Not everything can be prevented. People with, again, going back to breast cancer and, 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 and genetic mutations, we don't necessarily can prevent once we, if you have, this also applies, for example, for Alzheimer's disease and genetic mutations, just because we know the mutation and we know who may or may not have them does not mean that we can actually truly prevent the disease. We can modify it. And there's a lot of work that we're modifying the way things happen. Um, but the genetic predisposition may be strong enough that we don't have control. So, so <clears throat> there are, they are certain deficits we don't have power over, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Any, any other comments before I go to the next step here? So, you know, what are these deficits? So we talked about these high blood pressure. It's one of these potential deficits. When you have high blood pressure, you know, heart disease comes down the road from it. Um, what other kind of deficit? Well, if we don't sleep well, you know, we, we don't have the ability to fight as many diseases. We're anxious. There's a lot of disturbances that come. So when you lose the ability to, um, to sleep, do you basically have, you know, sleeping is a way of resisting disease, if you will. And when you don't sleep, you have a sleep deficit, then, then you lose that ability. So pathogenesis diseases downstream of that can come about, um, Loneliness, which has been recognized and we've talked about before as a public health issue, is it's it's you know kind of different than high blood pressure and diabetes, but it's very powerful as a when we have loneliness, there's a deficit of our ability to fight off uh, cardiovascular disease and other uh, conditions. Smoking is another way. So when you smoke, you lose your abilities to fend off um, problems with your arteries, and so so these are examples of deficits of the general resistance. So breathing healthy air, sleeping well, and being in a community living experience kind of are your general resistors, if you will, of pathogenesis or disease. So what's the other side of this? Well, you know, because, because this is kind of, again, the same thing, stay away from these things and you avoid disease. That's one limb of this. But the other limb up here, which is on the top, it says, you know, what if you can build on these general resources for resistance? So not only avoid things that are bad for you or can lead to problems, but what if I can leverage some things that now take me not just away from disease, but really promotes health, whatever health is. And health is a very personal thing, by the way. It's a subjective evaluation. Um, and, and we can maybe talk about that in a minute or so, but, <coughs> um, there are resources that allows you to provide this resistance and you, if, what if you build up on those, what if you have extra of those, what if we learn how to bring those and organize those around us in such a way that we maximize then going in the other direction, which is truly not away from death, but again, away from disease really, um, so what would those look like? What would anybody suggest would be, what are those things or resources we could leverage? Exercise. Uh, I'm sorry? Exercise. Exercise is a good one, yeah. Diet. Diet, healthy diet. <laughs> you can be unhealthy with diet. <laughs> um, Free yeah. Stress. Free it off from the stress, that's right. Not too much. Yeah. I'm sorry, what, what was that? Mary, what did you say? That's too much stress. Is too much for the body. Stress is too much for the body. That's right. Minimizing or managing the stress. Yeah, absolutely. All right, you're catching on with me here. 
Um, so these are your, you know, sleep, eating healthy, physical activity, access to healthcare, you know, going and getting your teeth clean and getting your mammogram and getting your, um, you know, cholesterol checked and seeing the doctor when you have a problem. Uh, and then community living, which is this social interaction that humans by nature are, you know, social entities. So uh, it's, it's having those. So when you surround yourself with those, you then now maximize those resources that provide the general resistance. And that's what brings uh, health. So really, you're, when you're in this limb, you're fighting that, which comes from these deficits. When you're on this limb, you don't think about these things. You're just really aiming towards what health is for you. And, and in that concept of health for you, which is again, a personal thing, then you can evaluate the class, the question, how do I can, how can I leverage? How can I control some of the things around me? Others I cannot control. Pollution at the level of the world, we can't necessarily, as a, as a level of an individual, we cannot necessarily affect it in the here and now. Um, but, you know, whether we put our seatbelt on or smoke a cigarette or uh, come out to the community center and hang out with others, you know, those are things in the here and now that we can uh, uh, affect. Does that make any difference to anyone thinking about things a little differently? Yes. You care to expand a little bit? Well, <laughs> uh, it's I don't mean to put you in the spot, but <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I was copying some stuff down, uh, so I hope that I'm on the right track. Um, so I'm really delighted to see that I can become um, an advocate of salutogenesis. I'm I'm going to be a salutogenesis. Um, uh, fan instead of <laughs> <laughs> instead of moving toward death which we all are as you said I can uh, understand that I'm also um, using healthful activities to move toward um, the positivity the whole idea of the sense of coherence is uh, helpful also because we can move in one direction I'm 86 moving to 87 this summer and um there are times when this life does not look that attractive uh, mm -hmm. just at, the, at this age and, you know, just looking around. And um, and also my body is beginning to wear out, actually, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have to um, I ha don't have to sink into a sense of negativity mm -hmm. or a sense of, oh, I'm just going moving into disease. I can actually move toward health no matter what my age so well, thank you makes, I, I really appreciate you sharing that makes some sense <laughs> yeah yeah no what sally I, said uh, makes sense to me the the issue is knowing it saying yes i should be doing that and doing it are two different things and sometimes they conflict with one another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i i Deal with that every day on cardiac rehabilitation <laughs> the concept of motivation and, and 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 activity and inertia it's how do we go from once we kind of understand it or think of it to actually doing something about it that's a big challenge that's a human that's a humanity challenge that's not a, a unique challenge um, also go through the program and they're done they say okay six p.m playing <laughs> go on to living their back to yeah how to maintain how to sustain that new lessons we learn or new activities we do huh Yeah, there are no clear, there are no uh, great answers to that other than this and having these conversations and see how we uh, each one, each one of us handles that, and each one of us can motivate each other, if you will, or support each other in that in that address. Do um, you have a comment? I, I yeah, I didn't want to. Well, I was just thinking, you know, 
you know, we should see the test. A regular discussion among my, my peers and my, my friends. I want to say that uh, to maintain a better health and be aware of it is just like taking care of yourself. Taking care of the car. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you have to have two, at least three, two nuts. <laughs> The same thing of the you know the, the human body, you know. Oh, uh, the technology can can determine if you have something there's something wrong with your mm -hmm. your your nuts or mm -hmm. your kidney or pancreas or something like that. So it's that one, you know. It's the thinking that uh, if you take care of yourself mm -hmm. like when your arrow the right arrow is prior before it happens and the other one is it's already happened so if you if you are in the prior area then that will be you know beneficial to the person but the thing is one thing too is that uh the person grow up, you know, and, you know, like uh, became um, advanced in age. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, then so many things get inside your body. It's the same thing as when you lose your car. Even though you have a tune-up three times, but if you have, a, you know, a, a, a 25,000, 30,000 mileage, mm -hmm. your car will stop. Yeah. At least Medicare has caught on to that now because that Medicare makes uh, physicians have well checks on elderly, older people. Right. Haven't you been called and said it's time for you to come in for your annual? Checkup or assessment or whatever they well visit. I don't know what they call them. So that's that's a boon, I think, and that's all. All that gets into this picture, which is yeah, kind of shocking actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not only come and see us when you're sick, but come and see us when you're well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the fact that Medicare is acknowledging that is a good thing. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're doing that with the medications too. So like. Patients can refill their medicine. If you're doing well, you don't think you just keep taking the same medicine, keep doing well, right? So you don't need to go see the doctor because you're doing well. Well, they won't let you refill the medicine unless you come back and see me and say, I'm doing well. And I write out, oh, he or she's doing well. So that means continue taking the medicine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now we got to kind of document you're doing well with it and keep going. Um, so yeah, to that point, I, I, I think how to, how to stay well. So um, I think aging is a very interesting conversation, and 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 all of us, if lucky enough, will go through this process of aging, um, in some way or another. And some of us will cope with it better than others. Um, and I myself, I'm just starting to look down the road on that process, um, dealing with parents who are aging and having trouble with it. Uh, I'm dealing with patients with aging and having trouble with it, but. We can talk about that all day long, but let me tell you, tell you something refreshing. Um, so I was two days ago at a meeting at UC Davis, a uh, research group meeting, and it was a group of investigators, about 20 of us, in a conversation about how to help people age healthy. And obviously aging affects our bodies and things are going to change. Like you said, the car, when it has, you know, 25, 50,000 miles, you may not want to take it in the, in the freeway because you're afraid of what may happen, but you may still drive it in the local town and the brand new car, you feel more comfortable going on the freeway because, you know, you assume that it's going to perform and handle that much better. So obviously we have to change our expectations. It's a dynamic that comes to the word dynamic on that definition It's dynamic. It has to change over time based on the realities around us. Um, but that does not mean you have to give up or not be healthy and not be well, if you will, through the aging process. So what this group is trying to do is saying, okay, so how do we help people that are aging to stay functional, well, and good out in their community? 
And, and so it's a group of investigators and they all in different fields trying to figure out how to build communities, homes and communities that are, can keep us away from the hospital and sick and, and, and it allows us to continue to be functional and enjoy somewhat of a different kind of healthy living because our bodies are different, but still, you know, on this, from a subjective point of view, a very good quality of life and a very active and thriving and whatever that means to us as people, rather than just saying, it's just all going downhill. And, you know, how, how can I stop the downhill effect, which is this over here, rather than how can I promote my ability to do things, even though I may have to slow down and I may not be able to do this still, but I can still do this other thing and enjoy that instead of this. And although I used to enjoy that before, now I can enjoy this and kind of how, and, and it's all based on technology. So it's like, how do you build technology? Like tools and engineering in the house, sensors to provide safety, you know, uh, 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 ventilation and heating and, and water and all these things that we take kind of for granted in a home redesign towards the needs of the aging population such that we can stay in our homes for much longer without having to be put or go somewhere where we can no longer stay in our homes um self-driving cars no what self-driving cars yeah it's <laughs> it's a little bit of the same concept self-driving uh, it's it's self-living kind of homes and communities where they need less of our own input to, to do, but still very functional for us to, do, to live. Um, and uh, so it's a very interesting, it's very interesting. Most of the group were, were engineers. And so most of them don't understand the human uh, 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 reality of, of aging, but that's okay. Cause they all have very good answers to problems that are not necessarily problems. <laughs> um, so, so. Oh, no, no worries. We'll go for it. So anyway, I, 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 I wanted to kind of explore this idea that it's not all about disease and it's not, and, and, and prevention is not just keeping diseases away, which I may have for years now coming here promoted in that way, but rather to think about that prevention really, prevention is kind of potentially a secondary outcome of living towards a healthy living it's, you know the salutogenic uh, uh concept if you were just kind of embracing what you know what healthy living for a long time looks like when you actually start engaging on that concept the side effect of that maybe that diseases may stay away um but it puts us in a conversation of a very very much of a something we're looking forward to rather than something is adverse and we're trying to run away from and although the result may still be similar, I propose to you that our mindset may be different enough that we may actually help dissipate some of the anxiety and the stress that comes from living differently. So exercise may be just kind of a painful thing to do because I want to not have high blood pressure. It's a different mindset than say, you know, exercise may actually, I may feel stronger, healthier, more strength, more able to stay up with friends and do things I want to do if I exercise. And in that thought, it's completely different because it's a positive emotion. And if you remember two or three months ago, I talked about the positive emotions and the negative emotions. So it's exactly the same result. You go and physically stay active, but you got to that one through a pathway of positive emotion and optimistic controlling health pursuit versus on the other one where exercise you got there with a negative emotion i hate this but i'm afraid of high blood pressure and i don't want to this and i don't want to have heart failure and yada yeah so you know it's an old kind of a adversity and i'm staying away from kind of bad things and that's like in the, in the side of negative emotions which on all, all of it on its own feed into the levels of anxiety and stress that come about from our health. So it's just really trying to think of this slightly differently, even though may, perhaps what we do may not, this, our actual behaviors may not actually be that much different. Uh, although you can argue that they could be, um, but the way we get there may be a slightly different mental program, if you will. And that was the purpose of the reason to kind of 
introduce this this thinking. <clears throat> Any questions? Let's see what else I have here. Okay, so I'm ready to switch to the research study that we're doing. If if, if there's no other thoughts, ideas, questions, comment, feedback about this. Dr. Lopez. Yes. Um, before you move into the research program, I just want to say that um, twice this spring, I have been through, I've been through your model. <laughs> and um, uh, negatively, I've dealt with a lot of depression. And mm -hmm. I just want to say it is so helpful to see a model because I, I recognized what I could do and how my attitude could have changed a bit. And so it, this has been very helpful for me. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the comment. I, 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 we, we had someone in the room also making a comment and, and I wanted to not, and I walked away to get some water because I was, thought I was going to choke. So I, I want to give everyone the opportunity to express their voice. So thank you for that comment uh, from home. Um, do you want to expand again with the comment you were making here in the room in the back? Give me the perspective of when you're young, catching on to, to being healthier, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the challenge of young being healthy is a really big one that I don't I don't necessarily, I mean, I know pediatricians are <laughs> thinking about it. I don't think us, us in adult medicine ever think about that. We take for granted that young people are healthy, period. Um but, you know, when I think about the people who have heart disease that come to my office, they started being unhealthy 30 years ago. And, and, and I don't have a good way to communicate with 20 year olds and tell them, you know what? In and out, the in and out line in Davis goes around the block 17 times. If you, if you know what I mean, in the on evenings, I have three kids at home and they all want in and out. And I said, no, and I get a riot. You know, it's like, you're the only father in this town that doesn't, and the reality is that I probably am <laughs> the only one trying to keep their kids from having in and out, which is terrible for you. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and, and so how do I communicate effectively? I have no idea. I'm clueless um, to young people about how this does matter 20, 30, 40 years down the road, even though in and out feels good right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And there's so many problematic things about like you know, people being anxious or exercising or following the law. This is one of the big issues about like even exercise in general is that people start weighing too heavy into that immediate injured or into like mm -hmm. sore and then they are less inclined to exercise just because of like that initial pain with exercise versus like if they slowly progress and then they can actually kind of Yeah. <laughs> so it comes we're bombarded with a lot of things to do real fast and time is always pressure. And so unhealthy style lifestyle, especially for food, become the way out of the, the stress of the moment and the pressures of the moment. So on that diagram, that means we're kind of always trying to kind of deal with deficits and really not right to promote 
our health because this is not our goal. This is not what's in our mind. Being healthy is not what's in our minds when we're young. I mean, in the, in the youth, that's what I see of my kids at home. Uh, it's not, it is not important to them. It's, it's for granted. Um, um, and I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to make that, 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 that different, how to make that difference. Um, There's so much on the media that, you know, grab this burger here, you know, it's only five something or this something, yeah. you know, like uh, Mary Lou would say, your life is so busy, where do you get to, you yeah. know, where do you have a chance to order that specific? Mm -hmm. Yeah, time and cost. That's right, cost too. It's just cheap to do the eat that way, for example. Yeah. It's fast and, and, and cheap and... Yeah. And then you learn your lesson when you get older and said, I guess I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then we start having that learning of this down the road where pathogenesis is already settling in. You know, diseases are settling in. And now we've got to start asking the question, how do we stay healthy? Whereas like, how do we become healthy? It's a much earlier conversation versus how do we stay healthy now that we've got starting to have diseases. Um, so it's a interesting conversation. I'm, I look forward to anybody's ideas or inputs about how to affect the young people I'm in this. I want to add to it. This makes me feel good about what we're doing in here, Mary, because you started it was all about old people and now it's pretty obvious that we're affecting us broader spectrum of the population and it's it feels good yeah. Yeah. to know that, that I'm teaching you just as much as I'm teaching any other older person that's right how to stay strong so yeah no absolutely more of us out in the world so that's the bottom line. yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh I I I I'm I'm your fan <laughs> I'm the fan of, of what we're doing here so let me shift gears a little bit to what we're doing in the research program, and 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 maybe you'll see some connection to what I we just talked about. But I'll go through this a little fast so you can converse about it at the end. Um, so again, we approach health. So so in this grant that we just got, we're not really the the AHA wanted us to look at cardiovascular disease, but we are trying to approach this from a health point of view, which is a little bit of already of a shift. So what are the factors that affect your health? And, and they're drawn in arrows that go out because they're kind of like potentially the three things that actually take away from your health. That's, so it's by design, the arrows are going away from health. So in this concept, for this research project, there were three concepts that we wanted to promote. It's, there's a psychosocial component, there's a biological component and an environmental component to your health or the lack of health, if you will. And that all of these, need to be evaluated if you truly want to impact people's health. So if you only deal with the biology and the, you know, the molecules and the cells, you missed out on, you know, the other two components, which are very, very important. And that's the premise of this study. So <clears throat> I've been doing this biological studying for now for 12, 15 years. I've talked to you before about it. We focus on myocardial infarction and heart failure. And we have this very intricate system on how to do this. And you're not meant to read any of this. This is just to show that we've been you know, thinking and doing this for a long time. So this grant was a lot less about this. And it was more about the psychosocial environmental component of things. And so it was the idea of bundling or bringing all three things. So instead of focusing all the time on only one limb or one arrow here, it was really trying to kind of get a sense of how all three of them are contributing to people's cardiovascular health. So the approach we took for psychosocial and environmental evaluation is a, it's called geocoding. It's a geocoding approach. So <clears throat> that's in contrast to, for example, for biological studies, we choose to, for example, to study the blood. The blood, it becomes a way to get to the biology. So geocoding is like the equivalent of saying, we're going to sample the blood. Well, in, in, in the psychosocial environmental space, there's no blood, but, um, how do we go and sample something to start understanding those two factors? We, we use what's called geocoding. So geocoding basically means we look at where you live and the location where you live and the characteristics of where you live as a person, and then ask questions about what is your environment like and how does it affect your health as a way to understand this environmental component. And the second part of this, what about your environment or 
who and where you live affects your mental components, which is a psychosocial uh, component. And in this case, we're looking at stress. So a concept that we call chronic psychosocial stress. So that's the specifics of what we're actually going to study is the interaction or contribution of the psychosocial with the environmental. And to get to it, we started from the geocoding side of things. And so what that means is we go to the map of California and we are, you may or may not know this, there's a lot of publicly available information about the location where we live. And so um, a lot of it is from the census, but there are lots of other uh, data collected by different ways that then becomes publicly available about the people and the kind and the and the and the and the physicality of where we live, like the roads and the greenery and the number of freeways and trees and and, and restaurants and things like that. So all of this, it's about the physical place where we live. All of this data is available by zip code. So you can look in individual zip codes and see what the characteristics of the people and the environment of where they live by zip code. And when you do this, we, and this is work from collaboration with Dr. Caderas and Dr. Isu at UC Davis. So this is not my primary work, but this is their work looking at all this publicly available data characteristics of the regions and the zip codes in, in Davis. And they identify that there are different clusters or groups of locations that are somewhat similar to each other. And so they came up with four clusters on this analysis. And one of the clusters is what they call this high risk cluster, which happened to be a population where it was mostly Hispanic, Spanish speaking, mostly African American black population uh, of low income, underinsure, which happens to have higher rates of smoking and higher rates of obesity and higher rates of diabetes. All of these, which are essentially risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So once we kind of can identify regions that based on their, on, their, on their geography have this constellation of factors that are known to be high related to cardiovascular disease. We, ask, we now have the ability to know where to go, physically speaking, where to actually go to meet people and ask people, how stressed are you? <laughs> how is your chronic stress like? How is your levels of stress in this area? And then it allows us to compare to people in other areas that based on the geocoding approach are uh, in, in environments that are predicted to be not so um, uh, disadvantaged or, um, or, or marginalized. And then ask the question, are the people who are in, the, in, the, in, the envir in certain environments, certain clusters more stressed than the people on the other? And how does the stress level contributes to their uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and or outcomes. There's a lot of, this is very high level what I'm saying right now. There's a lot of details uh, downstream of this, but just to kind of break down a little further. So they look at cluster number four, which is one of the four and they say, okay, well, we think cluster number four and the color coding in here is where the locations are in the map of California. Um, you know, what are the difference, the different medical traits? Like they look at obesity and smoking and even within the cluster four, there are special pockets of areas in California where people have higher obesity and higher smoking and other areas where they have lower obesity and lower smoking. So, so now we can kind of start looking at regional. So from an environmental point of view, we can look at actually air quality and pollution and noise and water quality on those locations and see how they correlate now with the cardiovascular risk factors like obesity and smoking. And from a psychosocial point of view, we can go to those areas and try to ask people questions about their stress and then start tra trying to connect this relationship between their levels of stress, their physical uh, environments. And then the last thing we're going to do in this, in this grant is some, some a smaller group of people will actually ask them to give us blood samples so we can actually do some of the biological testing. So the reason we were funded was because we have that we propose to connect all three of these things. All three of these things are not normally connected in medical research. They're usually studying one of these, like we've been doing for a long time, the biological only. So that's the traditional way of doing research. You just, you know, the environmental people are over there. I don't even know who they are. And they do their research. And the psychology people are over there. And we don't know who they are. And they do the research. So this project is bringing us all together and trying to sample these three different aspects on these different pockets of populations in California. 
and try to understand how the environment, the psychosocial stress, and the biology interacts. So it's a strategically focused research network. Uh, the call was for biological pathways of chronic psychosocial stressors in cardiovascular health. It's three, three universities were funded, Virginia Commonwealth, Ohio State, and UC Davis. So there's three of us in the country. It's a network, there'll be training. Um, this is the name of our study of our center, Psychosocial Stressors and Epidemics on Cardiovascular Health in Underserved Multi-Ethnic Populations in Northern California. It's called the Precise Center. Uh, and it is in partnership with Sac State. So Sac State is a partner with us at UC Davis for this project. It was one of the requirements uh, from the American Heart Association that we have partnership. So we can build up the training opportunities for people, students at Sac State. We can build the research opportunities for investigators at Sac State and give us the opportunity to collaborate with, <clears throat> just like we're trying to understand people from disadvantaged and marginalized uh, populations, we want to also try to uh, work and leverage and help uh, institutions that have less resources for research to really build their research portfolios and their opportunities to others. So, so this is an opportunity for UC Davis and Sac State now to uh, work as partners in research projects and, and research funding. So we're really excited about this. I am, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll show you a diagram. There's three projects under this center, and I am co-PI in one of the three projects uh, for this. Um, how long of study is it, and how much money did you get? It's a four-year study, and I think we got about two to three million. I forgot right now the actual number. It's somewhere in the two to three million dollar number. It, the reason I forget is because our own project is 1.6 but I can't recall what the other two projects are. And I think when you add them all up, it's like three to $5 million. And I don't know the sum of the three. Close, for the close, center. close enough, thank you. There's a center funded at UC Davis and the center has three projects and, and I am involved in one of the projects. Um, I actually have that in, in here. So there's three projects. Project one is the one that we're gonna do the population with the geocoding. And then project two and project three are going to look at mechanistic and uh, 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 studies of inflammation in, in, in social stress. And then the, the project three is going to look at blood pressure, heart rate, arrhythmias related to the stress. Um, so those are the three projects. So um, the center will be bringing all three of them together. Um, <clears throat> This is kind of the team. So to your answer, uh, uh, Linda, on project one, which is the clinical project, Dr. Caderas and I, he's, he's our heart failure specialist at UC Davis are the two co-PIs and then they're the, the three other, the two other groups here. Um, and I think I'm gonna stop there because we're almost to the hour and I wanna just make sure if anybody has any questions or any thoughts. It already started. <laughs> it started April 1st. It's kind of scary. Um, so we're already working on, on so we're going to put psychosocial uh, surveys together. And so we're working on putting the surveys together. And then we're going to be sampling people from, so we have the zip codes of, of those areas that I show you. And so we already have a large number of people from those uh, high risk zip codes that actually come to UC Davis with their condition, medical conditions. So we'll be uh, serving people from the hospital, from these areas. And then we're gonna to go to the communities, the same communities, and we're gonna survey people in the communities that are not patients with heart disease and try to compare the patients with and without heart disease, or I should say patients with heart disease and, 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 and community dwellers in the same area that don't have heart disease. And we'll be doing then their, their psychosocial metrics and then we'll be doing, we got the environmental information we get from publicly available environmental data. And then a small number of them will then be asked to donate blood samples to, to, to do the, the biological component. And what's the closest bad zip code here? <laughs> I can show you that, I actually have that. So this is from the data, from the study that we've done. So this is a map of, See here, Sacramento up here. 
Sacramento's up there. UC Davis is probably somewhere down here. Um, and so now the color coding, this is by zip codes. The blue is the less healthy place to live. And the green, the dark green is the healthier place to live by this healthy place index, uh, uh, a score that's been developed in California. And it, you know, it's a potpourri, right? It's a, it's a mosaic of, it's not, you know, from, from, you can cross the street and go from a healthy to unhealthy place. So this makes us a unique opportunity to sample people in healthy and unhealthy uh, areas in a very short distance from each other, geographically speaking. We don't have to go to another, you know, state or country to do find remarkable differences on healthy. Um, unhealthy. This is publicly available. If you look up healthy place index in California, you can actually put your zip code and look at the actual details of your zip code in terms of all kinds of metrics. Um, so this is just one of the sources of information we're using, and this is publicly available. This map has a uh, this is from this is their most recent map, but the data that feeds into this is probably since like 2015, 2016 to the press to 2021. So it's, there's always a lag. This publicly available data has a lag because it takes data time to process. Yeah. Could you put your the where we would go look up our zip code? The, the what yeah, you... if you if you type healthy place index is at the title of the slide. Okay, thank you. Healthy Place Index California, and it's a it's a it's a nonprofit organization who put this together and down in Southern California, and uh, and you should be able to put your zip code in there, and it will give you metrics. Like there's like thirty metrics about the neighborhood. Yes. I have to go. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, we're we're yeah, we're done. That was a super presentation. This, my pleasure. Yeah, I I've been um your patient in a. Uh, in you, in you rehab for 20 years now. Oh, I know all the doctors. Done. Oh, that's great. See you later. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. Nice hey. yeah, meeting you. Don't yeah, same. same. Good seeing you. Okay. Yep. So uh, that's what I have. I'm, we could chat as long as you guys want so to. Is but one of your social metrics going to be the census coherence? Social metrics of the sense. I have to learn more about the sense of coherence. There are metrics. There are actually surveys and stuff. Yeah. So we, we, we talk to Sharon about that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We got to see if we can sneak those in. There's a, that's what we're doing right now. Figure out what to put on the metrics for that. So, um, but. Age of the factors age and all. Um. So. <laughs> So we did in this project that I didn't show you the data, uh, we looked at the regions of healthy and unhealthy. And, and if you live in the poor, healthy regions, you have worse outcomes from after your heart attack. If you live on the healthy, on the healthy, which is in this column, uh, you have better outcomes. That's not what the data in this table. What I recently I showed you this table is to show you that the age is the same across all three. So age is not a factor to tell your outcome based on the region. We also look at the kind of heart attacks and they're no different. So it's not the kind of heart attack you had. We look at sex and it's no difference. It's not because of they're more males or more females. But when we look at race, it's actually different by race. So the area where the unhealthier neighborhoods where people actually have worse outcomes to their heart attack, despite the same treatment, because we have the data from the hospital, they all got the same treatment in the hospital, are more, predominantly have more uh, uh, Black, Asian, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders than the most healthy place. So clearly there's a, a, a racial separation here. And uh, <clears throat> we don't know yet. I mean, this is correlation. This is not uh, mechanistic in any form or shape. There, there, there's probably nothing about race itself that does that. Uh, this is probably because of the segregation of people from races in the unhealthy neighborhoods. That's the unhealthy neighborhood. The hypothesis is that the unhealthy part of the neighborhood is what brings that and it's poverty and other social reasons why people are more predominantly living in those neighborhoods. Um, and then, you know, it's the characteristic of the neighborhoods what brings in the poor outcome. So. Yeah, the 
does that website indicate what are the factors of the healthy index? So yes, they are. They are in the website. We we can pop it up right now if you guys want to. And is there just more bad water there, or is it? Uh... No, yeah, well, I was saying because some people experience certain events at certain times. Somebody who was born in the 1960s with high blood pressure has a life difference than one born in 1950 or 1940. Yes, trauma is very important, uh, very powerful. It's one of the things we're going to address. Uh, Erin was depressed because she looked at Porterville and she comes from a very unhealthy area. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. So give me a zip code. What zip code you want to look up? What's your zip code? Nine five nine five eight one six. So you're in Davis. Ninety five six one eight is Davis. Um, Give it to me again. Ninety five. Eight one six. There it is. So you are very healthy. So you're in the green zone, zip code green zone. So you are healthier than ninety one percent of other places in California. And so, well, 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 well. Scroll. You scroll down. Yes, it does. Policy action act. So economics you know, above poverty, employed is nearly 100%, per capita income is the highest. So these are percentiles for California. So it's because of those. And then you can look at education, social transportation, neighborhood, housing. Which one you want to look at? Clean environment. Um, Clean environment. Well, so your diesel PM sucks. <laughs> um, your drinking water contaminants is very good. Uh, your ozone is kind of on the smack in the middle and your PM 2.5, which are particles. These are particle stuff. Um, it has a, I think it has a, that, oh, what was that top one? I lost it. What happened? Is that a diesel? Diesel as in smoke from the cell phone? Car, car exhaust. I, sorry, I lost it. 95. Well, you're on the diesel. Is it on? The, oh, oh, that's right. I got to go. Yeah, uh, I got it. Uh, does it have an indication? Average daily amount of particulate pollution, very small from diesel sources. Yeah. High or low in that? Slow. It's low. That's, that makes it unhealthy. Percentile. Yeah. So, so, so you. Yeah. The green is healthier. The blue is towards the unhealthy. So, mm. so that, so that's why I'm, I'm judging that your blue, the diesel, whatever that number means, it's in the in the unhealthier because it's on the blue. Then you have race and ethnicity breakdowns here. Um, so, yeah, and uh, and then you have this equity marker, which I have to, I don't know, understand yet what it means, but. Yeah. It's a walkable space. That's yeah. Uh-huh. And suddenly you see people on the sidewalk walking. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. No, that I thought uh walkable may be one of the factors here. Mm. Think neighbor on the neighborhood, park access, retail diversity, tree canopy. So your tree canopy, your rate, retail diversity, and park access are very high. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And so you see how the characteristics of the neighborhood correlates with the health in the neighborhood. And, uh, and, and so that's, you know, when people talk about planning communities, this is, this is the data behind why you know, you plan the blue zones are, you know, the same way, you know, that you put more trees, more sidewalks, more, less cars, so people use, do more physical activity, you know, that kind of thing. So all of that goes into 
this is the concept of salutogenesis, right? We don't have mm -hmm. to accept disease because we just live in a sucky place. Mm -hmm. Is you know, can we construct environment? Can we control our environment so we can, you know, aim for health? If you look from that area 20, 30 years ago, it would be blue. It would be blue. Mm -hmm. Oh, Dr. Gonzalez? Yes. Can you do look at my zip code 95670? Yes. Hold on. What is it again? 95670. 670. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Give it to me again. 95. 95670. Let's forget to click on this one in the bottom. So you are in the 50th percentile. Okay. Okay. So you're kind of halfway in between. Okay. Everybody else. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. I mean, it was good to know. Uh, you're welcome. Can you check 95822, please? I went online and I couldn't find the place to put my zip code in. 95822. You're also 46, so you're kind of in the smack in the middle. John is winning mm. the party here. <laughs> <laughs> you're the HBI winner. <laughs> Careful, John. All these people are going to invade your. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. You're welcome. My pleasure.